Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte Today in Paris, French President Emmanuel Macron delivered an epic rebuke against the President of the United States. During a commemoration marking the end of World War I 100 years ago today, a war that you'll recall from your American history classes was followed by the rise of fascism in Europe. Macron's comments came just weeks after Donald leaders in Paris, though he was notably late to the main proceedings this morning. He did get a thumbs up from his favorite dictator, plus a friendly handshake from Vladimir Putin. And on Saturday, he attended dinner with leaders, including another of Trump's favorite autocrats, Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey. That dinner came hours after Trump canceled a visit to a cemetery for Americans killed in the war. The White House citing rainy weather. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said the rain grounded, grounded the presidential helicopter and that a motorcade would be logistically impossible. The cancellation prompted a rash of criticism. Nicholas Soames, the grandson of Winston Churchill, tweeted, quote, They died with their face to the foe, and that pathetic, inadequate, real Donald Trump couldn't even defy the weather to pay his respects to the fallen. As a way of comparison, here is how Canada's Justin Trudeau handled the rain last year during the 75th anniversary of the DFA raid in Ottawa. As we sit here in the rain, thinking how uncomfortable we must be these minutes as our suits get wet and our hair gets wet and our shoes get wet, I think it's all the more fitting that we remember on that day in Dieppe. The rain wasn't rain, it was bullets. Trump is scheduled to speak at another American cemetery in just a moment. You can see it there. We will continue to monitor it. Keep you posted on what he says. Joining me now is Natasha Bertrand of The Atlantic, Vote Vets Chairman John Soltz, NBC News correspondent Keir Simmons, and Sarah Kenzior, author of The View from Flyover Country, Dispatches from the Forgotten America. Thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I'm going to go to John um, first on this because I just want you to just explain for, for, for anyone you know in the audience who may not know, but I'm sure most people do, what, what it means to veterans for an American president to visit a cemetery like the one that Donald Donald Trump um, did not visit because of the rain. Um, what does that mean to American veterans? Yeah, it's, it's not a political event. I mean, I think this was a moment for him to really highlight what Veterans Day is all about, which was the end of World War One. I. I mean, most Americans don't know Veterans Day was really an evolution out of the armistice of, of World War One. And I, you know, just where I am here in Florida, you know, last night at dinner, asking, you know, people, hey, do you know what tomorrow is? And most Americans don't know. And I, I really think that every veteran fears being forgotten. And this was a real chance yesterday for the president to highlight not only the sacrifice of American veterans, but our role in the war itself, uh, in World War One, and our in our role as leaders in the world. And he really missed that opportunity to highlight the sacrifice that Americans made to end, you know, the Great War, um, which was ironically incredibly brutal in trenches of chemical weapons um, millions and millions of people died many of disease uh, and for him to duck out because of his hair I think that's a real missed opportunity for him as, as, as the president and the leader of the world um, to highlight a little bit of history that would have educated uh, our country and, and the rest of, of, of our globe 
Right, and you know, we can see the make good is happening right now. You can see that in the screen uh, as John was talking that uh, Donald Trump is at another cemetery, a different cemetery. He's got an umbrella to cover his, his hair. Uh, he's, he's doing that uh, at this point right now. I want to go to you, Keir, and, and just get from you. I mean, there were other world leaders who visited a different cemetery, and the other world leaders were shown. There were a lot of split screens uh, that I saw on social media showing other world leaders paying their respects to, you know, their own country's war dead. This was supposed to be the war to end all wars, wasn't it? Um, um, but, so this was something that was not just for the American president but really all Western world leaders kind of coming together to commemorate this great and tragic war that didn't, did, did the opposite of ending all wars. Yeah, the war to end all wars. Look, you know, Joy, I think uh, one of the... Uh, this is a moment where you can uh, kind of reflect, if you like, amid all the bluster uh, and uh, the political fire that we see day after day uh, these days, uh, when you look back at the millions of people who died in World War I and the millions who died in World War II, uh, you, it, it helps to kind of ground you, I think, a little bit. You know, hey, Joy, you know, my great-grandfather uh, uh, died on the first uh, naval, Royal Navy ship in World War I. My, my, my great grandfather died uh, serving uh, in the Navy in World War II. Uh, the generations before us have suffered in ways that we can only imagine. And, and I think there's an interesting point there, Joy, uh, which is that in a way, we are all so privileged. We, we have the privilege of, of having these arguments and, and, and having these fierce debates and this polarization because right now we don't face the kinds of threats that uh, they faced in the build-up to World War II with the rise of fascism. And at the same time, as you mentioned, there is a lesson there too, which is that is the kind of politics that we have to oppose uh, and, and we have to be wary of because we shouldn't fool ourselves that that kind of politics can't return. And it's not just a question for the US. Uh, you see it in Europe, particularly, for example, in, in Eastern Europe uh, you, uh, and the rise of, of the sort of celebration, if you like, of dictators uh, and, and the questions about democracy. Uh, the, a day like today is very useful. Useful, I think for all of us uh, to, to, to really think about uh, you know where, where we are now and where we want to be it is Monday the 12th of November of 2018 and you are in West Coast cookbook and speakeasy I am your chef de cuisine Justice Putnam and our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. Yes, folks, this is the day that we will be celebrating or honoring uh, Veterans Day. Uh, this is the day that we won't be getting uh, services like the mail, for instance, and that's just fine. Okay, well, uh, quite a weekend, huh? Uh, apparently, uh, Trump's uh, visit to Paris went uh, went about as well as we thought it would, didn't it? Uh-huh. This guy knows nothing about sacrifice. Very telling. Of course, we know the reason he was there. Okay? And I gotta hand it to the EU. They kept Putin and Trump as far apart as they could. Where even the Russian press and media are uh, reporting that uh, the planned meeting that was uh, not planned <laughs> uh, never took place. Though they did have some time to talk. So, uh, as General Michael Hayden uh, surmised, it was uh, just a brush pass to his handler. And we all know what that means if you've been watching The Americans. Or read any uh, Le Carre novel, for that matter. Okay. Um, boats are still being counted. And for some reason, that's considered to be un-American. Counting every vote is un-American. Only ragtime commie liberals count every vote. Ragtime. Yeah, that is a racist uh, connotation. Had a discussion with someone overseas. Not from here. Not, uh, let's shall we say, uh, steeped in the nuances of uh, American nomenclature. Who tried to argue with me that uh, the idea of uh, monkeying around was not racist, because uh, Anglophone countries say that all the time in uh, colonies that they've been holding under their thumb for how many hundreds of years. So uh, how do you argue with that? Had a telling conversation with my Trump bro. I love, I love my Trump bro. I love my whole family. But um, it, it was a very telling conversation, and I feel that I have failed as an older brother 
And I did, because I booked. I, I hightailed it out of there. He was a kid when I went off to college, and uh, I, I should have paid more attention to him growing up. Because it's obvious that uh, peer pressure does uh, wield a tremendous amount of influence over a person's life. I was fortunate to have peers who uh, challenged our, you know, each of us in our intellectual capacities about how to discern the truth. And I had peers that demanded that we get out of ourselves and help other people instead of everything being about us. Me, me, me. And unfortunately, I have to uh, confess and admit my brother's peers were the exact opposite. I had no idea that he had never registered to vote until, well, Trump came on the scene recently. I come from a family where we knocked on doors when starting when I was 10 years old. Apparently, uh, my parents got tired of that by the time he got to the point where he should have been knocking on doors, precinct walking. And uh, so it, it, it explains a lot. Because the least educated, uh, well, well let, let, let's back up a little bit, lesser educated in this instance, still has some intelligence, but a little knowledge is a dangerous thing now, isn't it? Um, apparently having some sort of issues uh, about grievances. That I suspected because my brothers made a bunch of money and, you know, sometimes uh, and oh, and 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 I did uh, uh, experience his business, which was very cutthroat. And it's easy to fall into racial stereotypes. I worked in restaurants. You have to avoid saying, I'm not going to serve those English people because they only tip five percent. The Canadians, I'm not going to serve them. They only tip five percent. And it goes on from there. You have to avoid that. Stop it. Okay? Put it aside. Good things will come to you. But certainly don't start sectioning people off by racial and national uh, identifiers and then determining that that's the only behavior that they can be uh, uh, involved in. That's the only behaviors that they will behave in. <laughs> And unfortunately, he sees the world in a much more, shall we say, black and white way. So when Trump praised his, uh, you know, lesser educated people, well, of course, because if anybody had like an ounce of critical thinking, they would see that this guy's a fascist or at least a demagogue, small minded businessman. Okay. Well, um, I still love my Trump bro. I think that if given enough time, well, let's put it this way, though. Uh, we have come to a particular agreement and he really wanted to talk about politics, but we agreed not to talk about politics when the family's together. And uh, I got to hand it to him. He started doing it and he checked himself. So maybe there is hope. I certainly care not to, to go after the Trump voter expecting their votes. No. <laughs> Unless we put them into education camps, not re-education camps. You have to educate them first before they can be re-educated. Start off with the first, and then if there's some problem, re-educate them then. Jeez. Uh, that went on for a while. Why don't we talk about what else is on the menu? Because there's so much news, we're going to... We're going to pack it all in, aren't we? Well, on the rest of the menu here in the uh, Bistro Cafe, uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, of course, at the top, that was Joy Reid's panel uh, about uh, you know reporting on uh, Armistice Day uh, ceremonies yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yep. A major rebuke against Trump and nationalism. And I will say it one more time. Trump is not allowed to change the definition of nationalism. Okay? Please. So uh, he wasn't a very happy camper, and now he's going to come back here and see if he can get away with some more, which is going to be tough. 
Okay, on the rest of the menu, Ted Cruz hired a data firm that has been banned by, by Facebook and is also under investigation by the EU. And he, you know, he hired them for a Senate campaign because it's Ted Cruz. I think people should be looking at that race a little bit more, too, don't you think? Kellyanne, Kellyanne Conway continues to insist the doctored video of CNN reporter Jim Acosta they doctored is not doctored. Sports. Sports uh, people uh, doctor their tapes all the time. We didn't doctor it. Yeah. These people. This is the big lie. Okay. It's the big lie. And Trump properties made millions off the midterm election. You thought all those conference rooms that all those various Republicans were meeting up in was just gratis? I don't think so. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Democrats urge Matt Whitaker to step aside from the Russian investigation, vowing to order him to testify before Congress early next year. I actually think he might end up in jail. There's an FBI investigation in that Florida scam. And his actual uh, threats of physical violence against invent inventors that were socking their money to them. $26 million judgment in the civil trial. Okay. And the FBI has a criminal investigation going on. Criminal. And if Pat Tillman's widow cannot speak for him, neither can you. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Go to our homepage at netroosradio.com, and if you scroll to the bottom of the page, to the right-ish, you will notice the chat room link. It says chat room right there. Uh, Kelly Lincoln monitors that, and a fine job she does indeed. So do check in there, and also check out her shows on Saturdays at the table with Kelly Lincoln at 3 p.m. on the West Coast, and that would be 6 p.m. East. And then later on, she teams up with Ricky May for the Roundtable Roundhouse Power Hour beginning at 9 p.m. West Coast, midnight East Coast, and a power hour it is indeed. Then, if you would just take a gander to the leftish of the page, at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice the Contribute button. Please become a Patreon of Netroots Radio. Um... I, I want all donations to go to the station. Please do that. And uh, a little uh, a little recurring donation goes a long way. Oh, let me also mention um, uh, I, I got a couple of new Patreons here, and, and um, I was curious if I should mention their names because that was part of the rewards when they donated a certain amount. But I will certainly get out the bumper sticker and the little ad, what we call the ad block, into uh, the physical uh, United States Postal Service mail. And you should, guys should be receiving that right away. So thank you for those uh, uh, donations or contributions. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we, are una- we are unable to do this without you. And uh, every little bit helps. So thanks so much. You can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we thank you for that, Tom. Kelly takes care of the Facebook platform for the most part. I kind of check in a little bit, but Kelly's the one that's really responsible. So thank you, Kelly. And uh, follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Also got a request to... uh, get the link to the player at our homepage because it's, you know, quite a few steps to get to, uh, from, you know, 
wherever I post on social media. And then you got to go to the Daily Kos diary. Then you got to find the link for, you know, the, the player. And uh, so I will now attempt to get the, that link uh, directly to the player up on uh, social media as well, so that it's much quicker for people and uh, a much easier ease of operation. All right, I'll do that. Okay, so uh, you can also follow the show on Twitter at Justice. I mean, sorry, at West Coast. No, no, no. If you want to follow the show on Twitter, you have to go to at Cookbook West. My God, it's Monday. And um, uh, on Facebook, though, we're at, at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Oh, my God, it's Monday. I got to bear with me, folks. I'll get through this. Okay, and uh, you can find podcasts of the show by way of Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn, uh, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever fine podcasts can be found. All right, I better get on this. Ted Cruz hired this data firm, and it's been banned by the EU for what they did in Brexit. But <laughs> look, this has worked before. For the Republicans, they're they're not going to give up this uh, cheat very easily now. So this is by Martin Sismar, Martin Sismar out of Raw Story. In his successful 2018 re-election campaign, Ted Cruz employed a data firm that has been banned by Facebook for using stolen user data and which is under investigation in Europe. Oh, my. Cruz deployed a smartphone app created by a software team at the heart of the Cambridge Analytica controversy in the campaign's closing hours, the report says. Despite the developer being banned by Facebook because the company says it used stolen user data in the 2016 presidential campaign. Well, it worked for Trump. It's got to work for Ted, and it looks like it did. The firm, Cruz used aggregate IQ was involved in the Brexit campaign and has since been targeted by investigators under Europe's data privacy law. In April, Facebook announced it had suspended aggregate IQ over its improper access to the data of millions of Facebook users. But over a dozen apps made by aggregate IQ remain connected to Facebook's platform until May and June, when Facebook belatedly took action against that. Darn, you found those? You found them? Okay, we'll take them off. Damn. The company's name was hidden from the description in the App Store, and Cruz refused to comment about what the, what the firm may have done for him. Well, we can only imagine now. We'll learn later when it's too late, as usual. Adam Peck of Think Progress brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. Nothing goes to waste here, folks. Everything has a purpose. All right. It is universally understood, at least by any anyone in a world governed by facts, that video shared by the White House last week of a confrontational moment between Donald Trump and CNN journalist Jim Acosta was doctored. The footage was altered to make it appear that Acosta was more physically aggressive than he was during a brief encounter with an unidentified White House intern who actually has been identified as a deputy press secretary making 130 grand a year. Huh. All right. I mean, because she was wearing a pretty nice brown shirt dress, uh, burgundy, but it was, you know, look, same if you look at colorized uh, film. From back in the day, and you know which days I'm speaking of now, you you know. Check it out. You'll see. All right. Uh, who tried to take away the microphone Acosta was using while posing a, a question. And uh, Adam Pike uses the P word here. And according to the Netroots 
uh, radio style manual here. Hold on. Let me. Okay. Yeah. Right here. It says uh, when Donald Trump is occupying the White House, uh, he, he shall not be referred to as the president. Okay. That's the only use of the P word we're allowed. All right. So, but uh, apparently they don't have the NetRiz radio style manual at Think Progress. I should send them one. Of course, Trump and his rabid supporters do not inhabit the same plane of fact-based existence. And on Sunday, which was yesterday, White House strategist Kellyanne Conway appeared on Fox, because, of course, that's the only place that people would believe this stuff, to once again claim on behalf of the administration that the doctored video that they doctored was not doctored. Well, host Chris Wallace asked Conway to comment about the White House's decision to tweet a video that was clearly altered to make it look like it was more of a physical confrontation than it really was. That was a quote from Wallace. And he disclosed that he himself believed Acosta's actions to be inappropriate. I'm still trying to figure out what was inappropriate about Acosta. I mean, does everybody forget Helen Thomas? I mean, come on. Jeez. I just, it just drives me crazy. All right. Conway, in keeping with her usual modus operandi, took exception with absolute truth. Well, Chris, first of all, what do you mean by edited, or as others are saying, doctored video? He either put his hands on her and grabbed the mic back, or he did not. And he clearly did. Now, nobody, including Acosta himself, disputes there was contact between uh, the, the, who we know now as a deputy press secretary making 130 k a year. And she reached for the mic held by Acosta. But the doctored video, shared by InfoWars and then disseminated by press secretary Sarah Capis Sanders, zooms in on Acosta's head and then speeds up the footage to make it appear as though Acosta was hitting the staffer's arm with force. And even and Wallace even told Conway that. Oh, well, that's not altered. That's sped up, said Conway of <laughs> the altered video, somehow managing to keep a straight face. Now, the dictionary definition of the word altered is to be made different in some way. That's not doctor. That was just sped up. All right. Well, uh, I have to tell you, everything that we bring out about this is considered a conspiracy. Okay. By the MAGA hatters, the MAGA haters, the MAGA hatters, everything. They're in their little silo. They believe what they believe. And uh, a propagandist like Kellyanne Conway is perpetuating the propaganda. Progress brings us this last offering here at the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Now, last I checked, it looks like the Democrats have 85 or 86 investigations that they can launch immediately as soon as they uh, uh, take over the committee, uh, the co committee chairmanships in January. So uh, I believe a, mo a lot of these emoluments uh, cases, though, might go more towards state and local courts. So we'll see how this works out. But Trump owned and branded properties cashed in during the midterm elections. Uh, according to a CNN analysis, which found that campaigns and outside groups spent at least $3.2 million at the hotels and resorts. Maybe that's what Trump was taking to Paris with him. I mean, Vlad has to have his vig. Okay? I mean, all mob bosses do. And Trump has to kick up. You think he's the mob boss? No. 
He's a wannabe, though. He went to a, uh, a mob boss themed finishing school. The CNN analysis of Federal Election Commission data found that the Republican National Committee was the biggest customer spending at least 1.2 mil at Trump branded property since the beginning of 2017. Because they have to give VIG to kick it up, keep kicking it up. And Trump himself has also thrown money at his property, spending more than $950,000 in Trump properties in the last two years. Trump properties benefited even more during the 2016 election cycle when they made 3.7 mil from campaigns and PACs. And the uh, spending isn't limited to just campaign seasons. According to ProPublica, Trump properties have made more than $16 million from government agencies and political campaigns since Trump has announced his candidacy. I don't think that's allowed in our representative Democratic Republic. Now, is it? No, it's not. Okay, let's get to our break. And when we come back, we are going to go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, what's in an acronym? In the city where our reviews are recorded, Charlottesville, Virginia, Angie Thomas's young adult novel, The Hate You Give, is required reading at the high school. Now we have the movie version, which the trailer tells us is a chronicling of yet another white cop, unarmed black teenager encounter. And while it is that, it's way more. The incident, in fact, doesn't occur until about a quarter of the way through. Before that, it's a film about black identity, black life and family, and the way that's intertwined. Though the film opens with the talk that African-American parents sadly have to have with their kids about the police, which is inherently serious, it then almost takes on the demeanor of a romantic comedy before what we know is coming occurs. The story is told from the perspective of 16-year-old Star, played by Amanda Stenberg from The Hunger Games and Everything, and who commands the film. She lives in what she calls the hood, but thanks to her parents, is attending an exclusive, mostly white private school miles away. She even has a white boyfriend. The incident, of course, changes everything, not only in her life in the neighborhood, but at school, where the humor of the preppy's hip-hop affectations becomes a different matter entirely. The dramatic convention of using a momentous event to throw light on an issue is time-worn, but honed perfectly here by director George Tillman and a supporting cast that includes Russell Hornsby as Star's dad, Common as her black police officer uncle, and K.J. Appa from Riverdale as her never-stereotyped boyfriend. If there's a criticism of the hate you give, it would be an ending that steps away from its hard-hitting social justice temperament. Otherwise, this is one not to miss. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. A baby's laugh is unmistakable. (laughs) But aside from its squealing, high-pitched quality, there's another factor that sets a baby's laugh apart from ours. Babies laugh on the exhale and the inhale, whereas adult humans tend to laugh predominantly on the exhale. So the classic kind of ha, ha, ha. Disa Sauter, a psychologist who studies emotions at the University of Amsterdam. Sauter and her colleagues collected 44 samples of babies laughing, from the ages of 3 months to 10 months, all the way up to 18 months. They played the samples for about 100 untrained volunteers and asked them to deconstruct the laughs. Were the babies laughing on the inhale, the exhale, or both? And there we find a nice relationship between the age of the baby 
and the amount of the laughter that is happening on the inhale. The younger the baby, the more laughs on the inhale. Because remember, our laughs gravitate towards the exhale as we age, and Sauter thinks one reason for that could be that we gain more vocal control as we learn to talk, because speaking also happens primarily on the exhale. She presented the preliminary findings at a meeting of the Acoustical Society of America in Victoria, Canada. And now her team is in the process of checking the judgments of the volunteers against those of professional phoneticians. As it happens, human babies aren't the only primates who laugh both breathing out and breathing in. Chimps do it too. <laughs> they go like, you know, they laugh just more continuously while inhaling and exhaling. But it's, yeah, it's true. It's totally difficult to do on purpose. But Sauter, I thought, pulled off a pretty good impression. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Occasional aches and pains are an expected part of life, but for many people, pain is a constant companion. Dr. Chad Helmick is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to manage chronic pain. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thank you. Chad, how many people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain? In 2016, 50 million adults had chronic pain, which is pain on most or every day in the past six months. More interesting, though, is that 20 million people have high-impact chronic pain, which is chronic pain that also limits their work or life activities on most or every day in the past six months. This is a problem because chronic pain is associated not only with the symptoms, but with anxiety and depression, reduced quality of life, and the risk of opioid problems. What are the most common causes of chronic pain? The most common causes generally relate to the bones and joints, like low back pain and arthritis, but there are many other causes, headaches, sickle cell disease, fibromyalgia, surgery and injuries, and many, many others. Is chronic pain more common in any particular group of people? Yes, it's, uh, it occurs at all ages, but it's more common in um, older middle-aged adults and in the oldest old, 85 and older. It's also more common in women, poor people, and those who live in rural areas. How is chronic pain treated? Well, the first thing to do is to get a diagnosis, which can help guide treatment. But the thinking about chronic pain now is that it becomes a chronic disease by itself, regardless of the cause, and that can cause significant problems. The real goal in management is to have a manageable level of pain, not to get rid of all pain. There are several steps that can be taken, and these are sometimes difficult to do because of barriers to access. But it makes sense to do the simplest and safest things first. And these are non-drug steps, things like physical activity. Walking is perfectly good to help reduce pain. Also, self-management education can give you some confidence in managing chronic pain when you're on your own. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological therapy, better sleep, which usually means less alcohol, and seeing a chiropractor or getting biofeedback and massage. If that's not enough, non-opioid drugs like Tylenol or Motrin and Advil or Naproxen or Aleve can help. If those don't work, then it's time to consider something stronger. Sometimes that's opioids, but there's not great evidence that opioids are good for long-term pain in most people. Do you have any advice for people suffering from chronic pain? Well, it's important to work with a variety of providers who are working together to help you. Uh, the goal, again, is manageable pain so you can live a productive life. This can include physical therapy. Most people can walk to treat any underlying depression or anxiety and to avoid further injuries. Finally, the National Pain Strategy is laying out a strategic roadmap to improve pain management system in this country. Where can listeners get more information about managing chronic pain? Listeners can go to the NIH website, nih.gov, and type in National Pain Strategy. Thanks, Chad. I've been talking today with Dr. Chad Helmick about ways to manage chronic pain. If you're experiencing daily pain, talk with your healthcare provider to ensure you have the correct diagnosis and know how to manage your condition. 
Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. In June, our immigrant-bashing president ordered an end to his own warped policy of forcibly tearing terrified migrant children from the arms of their asylum-seeking parents. Trump declared, I didn't like the sight or the feeling of families being separated. Yeah, bad optic, as PR consultants call scenes of such thuggishness. So he and we no longer have to witness nightly TV coverage of shrieking toddlers being taken from their parents and hauled off to federal warehouses. But wait, out of sight doesn't mean that depravity has ended. Some 500 of the 2,900 children who were snatched last spring are still in government custody scared that they'll never see their parents again and traumatized by the uncertainty of what'll happen to them. Worse, more refugee children are being incarcerated every day as they seek asylum from the horrors of rapacious gang wars and abject poverty in their Central American homelands. More than 12,000 migrant children are now out of sight and out of mind in our government's warehouses, military bases, and sprawling tent cities and Trump is requesting money to lock up another 20,000 children. All this trauma and cost is the result of the Trumpeteers' inhumane and failed zero-tolerance policy of jailing children, even babies, in hopes of scaring other refugees from seeking asylum in our land of opportunity. They created this humanitarian crisis, and rather than ending it by rushing in hundreds of lawyers and judges to process the asylum requests, Trump and his rabidly anti-immigrant ideologues are taxing us by building more jails for refugees while also openly violating the law that says immigrant children cannot be locked up for more than 20 days. This is Jim Hightower saying, for more about Trump's sick and sickening policy, contact Kids in Need of Defense at supportkind.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. Jeff Sessions was the worst attorney general in modern American history. I'm Bill Newman. And this is the Civil Liberties Minute. And that's what the ACLU's executive director, Anthony Romero, recently said. Romero went on to say that Sessions was, quote, an egregious violator of civil rights and civil liberties who plotted to deport dreamers, to discriminate against trans people, to perpetuate and expand senseless enforcement of racist drug laws, to use religion to discriminate against LGBTQ people, to undermine reproductive rights, to abandon protections for women subjected to violence. There's more to this list, but our time is limited. Romero then continued, quote, the dismissal of the nation's top law enforcement official is a huge step that should not be based on political motives or done to protect the president or his cronies from the law. While the Constitution grants the president the authority to dismiss his cabinet members, the Senate must demand that any nominee for attorney general commit to not interfere in the special counsel's investigation, end quote. Indeed, the Senate must make that demand and stand by it. No flim-flam, no capitulation, nothing less. That is because today, right now, we are engaged in a fight for the rule of law, a fight that we must win because our constitutional system is at stake. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. From New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. President Trump ordered Friday that migrants crossing illegally into the U.S. via the Mexican border be ineligible to be granted asylum, claiming America's immigration system suffers from an overloading that's only getting worse. That presidential proclamation is already facing legal challenge and may well be struck down. Angelo Guisado is a staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. 8 U.S. Code 1158 is very clear that an individual who states a credible fear of return to their home country can apply whether or not they apply at a port of entry 
or if they cross between ports of entry. Christy Delafield, the director of communications at Mercy Corps, says America's international legal obligations are just as unambiguous. According to the 1967 Refugee Protocol, to which the United States is a party, asylum seekers have the right to present themselves at a border and request protection. The White House argues asylum seekers can still make their claims at official border crossings, but that's become increasingly difficult, too. Some prospective asylum seekers at a crossing near San Diego have been told to wait some five weeks, while others in Texas have been turned away after simply stating their home countries. So much for the big, beautiful door in the wall that President Trump touted for those wishing to enter the U.S. legally. And even if Trump's new rule is eventually blocked, Delafield says real harm can still befall those seeking asylum protection. Somebody somewhere who should have the right to seek asylum is going to present themselves at a border crossing, informal, irregular. They may be denied due process. And you can't take that back. That impacts someone's life forever. Guisado agrees and says asylum seekers who attempt to cross illegally into the U.S. will be hit particularly hard. It's doubly bad. So these people will have not only criminal convictions, but now their humanitarian protections will be stripped away. Luke Vargas, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Ash Mondays. We always like to begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 21 degrees Fahrenheit. Our inevitable slide to winter continues. Uh, Looks like we're going to have the same uh, temperature as yesterday, which was in the mid-upper 60s, oh my God. And then we uh, will dip precipitously to a low of, well, they're saying the low 30s, upper 20s. We'll see how that goes. Winds are light and variable out of the northeast and will remain so in the next uh, foreseeable future. Uh, no chance of precipitation. Uh, relative humidity is quite low. We'll get to that in just a moment. Only uh, forecast of rain is about a week and a half off, which is in my book a little too far out to make that prediction. But it's always nice to hold out hope now, isn't it? Uh, the forest or the wildfires that uh, occurred, uh, devastating. Uh, I did spend a lot of time in paradise. I may have mentioned that before. In my uh, younger days, when I was traveling the country with Cottonmouth, and uh, uh, so uh, they could use some precipitation there. They really could. All right. And uh, also down in Malibu. Oh, my God. Okay. So it looks like uh, ragweed pollen is the dominant uh, pollen that is causing people problems, and that is rated low. The air quality index is moderate at 51 parts per million. went up because people are burning a lot of wood uh, in their fireplaces because it is cold. It's chilly. And that daytime UV index is low at 2, as I said, our inevitable slide towards winter. Uh, barometric pressure is 30.39 inches and fall. Okay, just falling. Visibility is up to nine miles, and that relative humidity is currently at 47%, but it looks like we're slated to go down into the low 30 percentiles. Indeed. Okay, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. They do, positively. London is 52 and partly cloudy. Paris is 53 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 66 and sunny. Kiev is 31 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 50 degrees and partly cloudy. Hong Kong, 72 and clear. 
Tokyo is 61 degrees with showers in the vicinity. Sydney, Australia is 64 and fair. San Francisco, California is 52 degrees and they're fair as well. And New York, New York is 45 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny with a weather advisory. And I bet, yes, indeed, it is a small craft advisory for gusting winds of, oh my God, 60 miles an hour. You better be careful. All right. So uh, that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Sarah N. Lynch and David Shepherdson from Reuters brings us this first offering here, if you don't count weather from around the world, at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Dateline, Washington. That must be D.C. Top Democrats stepped up pressure yesterday, Sunday, on acting U.S. Attorney General Matthew Whitaker, I would say unconstitutional and fake, acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker to step aside from overseeing a special counsel probe into Russian meddling in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, vowing to order him to testify early next year. Representative Gerald Nadler, the expected incoming chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, said the committee plans to subpoena Whitaker to testify next year as its first witness. He should recuse himself. He has expressed total hostility to the investigation. His appointment is simply part of an attack on the investigation by Robert Mueller. I would say it's a out-and-out obstruct, obstruction of justice, but we have to go through the proper protocol to discern that now, aren't we? In a letter to the Justice Department's chief ethics officer, Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer, House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi, and other Democrats asked whether any ethics attorneys at the Justice Department had advised Whitaker to recuse himself and demanded details on any ethics guidance Whitaker has received. Well, the only ethics guidance he's received is how to scam people out of their money, making them think that their inventions are actually going to be promoted in their best interest. Come on. Allowing a vocal opponent of the investigation to Oversee it will severely undermine public confidence in the Justice Department's work on this critically important matter, the letter said. Democrats have increasingly expressed alarm since last week when Trump ordered Jeff Sessions to resign and replaced him with Whitaker, Sessions' chief of staff. How do you do that? By not caring one whit about the Constitution. Sessions' ouster paved the way for Whitaker to take over oversight of Mueller's investigation from Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who appointed Mueller in, the May, in May of 2017 after Sessions recused himself from the probe. Yeah. Prior to working at the Justice Department, Whitaker made multiple negative comments about the Mueller investigation and its scope. In addition... Whitaker is also a close friend of Trump's 2016 election campaign co-chair, Sam Clovis, who has since become a witness in the Mueller investigation. Deeper and deeper and deeper, isn't it? Uh, Kellyanne Conway, a counselor to Trump, defended Whitaker's uh, oversight of the probe when asked about it on ABC's This Week. Comments that Matt Whitaker made as a private citizen on cable TV does not disqualify him from being fair and impartial by overseeing this investigation. She added, oh, I'm sorry, she added, Trump is 100% behind Matt Whitaker. Of course he is, because he'll be fair and impartial by overseeing this investigation to make sure that Trump doesn't get in investigated any further and anything that has been investigated will be quashed because he's a toady. Oh, did I mention he will be going to jail for an FBI criminal investigation ongoing? Hey, yeah. 
already already had a twenty six million dollar civil judgment against the operation. Now the criminal charges will come. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle. C'est tout. C'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer. Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est tout Marie Tillman, writing at the Washington Post uh, has this final offering here on observed Veterans Day at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasies Chef's Table. I often think about what legacy means, and I've learned something important about it in the 14 years since my first husband, Pat Tillman, was killed in Afghanistan. The way all of us live our lives is important to how we are remembered, but when you're an icon, which Pat became, your legacy has to be guarded. An icon's life and image enter the public domain, and people often try to co-opt it to suit their own needs. Since last year... I've watched from the background as professional athletes have taken a knee to draw attention to injustice and racial inequality in the United States. Pat was in the military, so many people want to attach a brand of blind allegiance to him and use him to argue that kneeling during the national anthem is unpatriotic. Pat was also against the Iraq War. So many others want to use him to argue against American involvement in overseas wars. His essence is bent to fit an agenda. Pat's life has become symbolic, but he was a flesh-and-blood man, and there was nothing about him that, that fit into any neat category. He was an athlete who didn't really pay much attention to sports. He was outspoken and opinionated, but a convincing argument could change his views. His nuanced thinking was what I loved most about Pat, that he could love his country so very much. And I've asked him countless, and I've been asked countless, countless times to comment on what Pat would have thought about the National Football League protests. But I've always declined. Over the years, I've become used to people wanting to know what he would have thought about something in the news or assign a way of thinking to him based on what we know about him or what we know about who he was at 27 years of age. They want to freeze him in time. I find it ironic because Pat was always known as a free thinker who was constantly growing. He was different from when we got together at 16, from who he was at 27, and he would have been different too at 42. We should be able to respect his willingness to sacrifice for what he believed in without looking at it through the lens of today's divisive political climate. So while I still refuse to speak for Pat, I will speak as a widow a wife, a mother, an American, and yes, a patriot. I think patriotism is complex. Like Pat himself, it was not blind or unquestioning, and it is a fool's errand to argue over who's allowed to claim sacrifice. When I look around at the vitriol aimed at them for expressing their beliefs and at the compulsion to simplify complicated issues in order to pit people on opposing sides, I want to kneel too. Because I believe we are at our best as Americans when we engage in constructive dialogue around our differences with the goal of understanding one another. I can't say how Pat would have felt about race in the United States today or kneeling during the national anthem, but I can say that he would have engaged in thoughtful and respectful discourse, never shying away from the nuance, never taking the easy way, and looking always always for a conversation
instead of a fight. And that's the icon of Pat Tillman that we should hold dear in our hearts as patriotic Americans. Not something bent to our own wishes uh, that is a reflection of our own biases and desires. Please. All right, we are at the end of our broadcast period for the day, but Netroots Radio will broadcast on for all that breaking news. We'll visit with you tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will visit with you right here tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bone appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Don't be